Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Baptism of Fire by Andrzej Sokowski. So this is one of the books in the Witcher series. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So... The Wizard's Guild has been shattered by a coup and Geralt is seriously injured. The Witcher is supposed to be a guardian of the innocent, a defender against powerful and dangerous monsters that prey on men. War rages across the land, the future of magic is under threat and those sorcerers who survive are determined to protect it. It's an impossible situation in which to find one girl, Ciri, the heiress to the throne of Sintra, has vanished, until a rumour places her in the Nilfgaard court preparing to marry the Emperor. Injured or not, Geralt has a rescue mission on his hands. So we get a lot of politics here. What I think is good in this one is that in the previous books, it kind of feels like a lot of build-ups happening, but nothing's really going on. And then finally we start to see a lot more like plot and uh, the politics really kind of reap, like reaping the rewards of all the foundation work they've done in the earlier books. Uh, I have said in the past, like the short stories have probably been my favorites. I think that still holds true, just because I think you can get more ideas across there. But um, this, this, at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm sold on the novels as well now. So I thought this was interesting uh, in terms of like showing some of the magic and the creatures and all that kind of stuff, but also human nature. With a swift and practiced movement, she slit the skin from sternum to anus, adroitly running the blade around the genitalia. She cautiously separated the layer of fat up to her elbows in blood. She severed the gullet and pulled the entrails out. She cut open the stomach and gallbladder, hunting for bazaars. She didn't believe in their magical qualities, but there was no shortage of fools who did and would pay well for them. And we get this little bit I liked. The minister, Jikstra said, looking up at the ceiling, resigned from the post owing to his poor state of health. The ambassador nodded gravely. He knew perfectly well that the foreign minister was languishing in a dungeon and, being a coward and a fool, had doubtless told Jikstra everything about his collusion with the Nilfgaardian secret service during the demonstration of torture instruments preceding his interrogation. I like this. This bit's interesting because it sort of throws, throws the old cliche on its head. It smacks to me of female chauvinism, Sabrina Glevisic said with a sneer, particularly coming from your lips, Philippa, after your change in sexual orientation. I have nothing against men. I go further, I adore men and I cannot imagine life without them. But after a moment's reflection, yours is actually a reasonable proposal. Men are psychologically unstable, too prone to emotions, not to be relied upon in moments of crisis. My cat is attacking the tripod. And then uh, a little bit, little bit later we get, there is nothing worse than chauvinism underpinned by scholarship. And uh, I want to read this little action scene out because I think that Sukowski writes it particularly well. Gerald, who was hanging onto one of the cartwheels, saw a fair-haired girl with a drawn bow dashing out of an alder grove. The horseman saw her too. They couldn't fail to see her because at that moment one of them tumbled backwards over his horse's croup, his throat transformed into a scarlet pulp by an arrow. The remaining three, including the leader in the helmet with a nose guard, assessed the danger immediately and galloped towards the archer, hiding behind their horse's necks. They thought the horse's necks represented sufficient protection against the arrows. They were mistaken. Maria Baring, also known as Milva, drew a bow. She took aim calmly, the bowstring pressed against her cheek. The first of her attackers screamed and slid off his horse. One foot caught in the stirrup and he was trampled beneath the horse's iron shod hooves. Another arrow hurled the second from his saddle. The third man, the leader, who was already close, stood in the saddle and raised his sword to strike. Milva did not even flinch. Fearlessly looking straight at her attacker, she bent her bow and shot an arrow right into his face from a distance of five paces, striking just to the side of the steel nose guard and jumping aside as she shot. The arrow passed right through his skull, knocking off his helmet. The horse did not slow its gallop. The horseman, now lacking a helmet and a considerable part of his skull, remained in the saddle for a few seconds, then slowly tipped over and crashed into a puddle. The horse neighed and ran on. And an interesting note about Milva, it says, although she had shot several arrows, there was only one imprint. The bowstring pressed against the same place each time. It's a, a sign of her marksmanship there. Somebody said, fuck me with a mangy rabbit, which is a great line. And this is like a prescient line here because obviously it kind of reflects what happened in our world. Thank you for your kind words about poets and poetry and the archery lesson. Good weapon, a bow. You know what? I think the arts of war will develop in that direction. People are going to fight at a distance in the wars of the future. They'll invent a weapon with such a long range that the two sides will be able to kill each other while completely out of eye shot. Like drones. Uh, an interesting quote here. They say that war's a male thing, Milva growled, but they have no mercy on women. They have to have their fun. Fucking heroes, damn them all. Somebody called somebody else a plonker, which felt a bit weird to me. I think that was a bit of a translation faux pas. I'm sure it worked better in the original Polish, whatever he said. We had this little exchange. What a, what a bow, Zoltan Shivy grunted in awe. What a shot. 
What a shot my ass, the Witcher said, wiping blood from his face. The Horseman's got away and he'll be back with a bunch of his mates. She hit him, and it must have been 200 paces. She could have aimed at the horse. The horse isn't guilty of anything, Melva panted with anger, walking over to them. She spat and watched the Horseman disappear into the forest. I missed the good for nothing because I was a bit out, because I was a mite out of breath. Ugh, you rat, running away with my arrow. I hope it brings you bad luck. She goes really out of her way to make these special arrows. And we get her, hey Witcher, where are you going to get a token of gratitude? To get a pair of boots, Geralt said coldly, stooping down over the long-haired marauder, whose dead eyes stared heavenwards. These look right for me. Battlefield looting, stay classy. We got the, this um, sort of farce going on. Oh, Zoltan stated. What, where? Dandelion asked. It's Dandelion, I don't know how to pronounce it. Standing up in his stirrups and looking down into the ravine in the direction the dwarf was pointing. I can't see anything. Oh, don't drivel like your parrot. What do you mean, oh? It's a stream, Zoltan calmly explained. A right bank tributary of the Shotler. It's called the O. Eh? Not a bit of it, Percival shut and back laughed. The A joins the Chotler upstream, some way from here. That's the O, not the A. I want to read this little bit here. Uh, this bit's about the Mandrake, which I think will be interesting if you're a Harry Potter fan to, com to compare it to those Mandrakes, I guess. Why, Zoltan said, filling the flask from the pail. If it only wailed. Mandrake, they say, screams so horribly it can send you up the wall. And moreover, it screams out evil spells and showers curses on whoever uproots it. You can pay with your life taking a risk like that. That sounds like a cloth-headed fairy tale, Milva said, taking the flask from him and drinking deeply. She shuddered and added, It's impossible for a plant to have such powers. It's an infallible truth, the dwarf called heatedly, but sagacious herbalists have found a way of protecting themselves. Having found a mandrake, you must tie one end of a rope to the root and the other end to a dog. Or a pig, the gnome broke in. Or a wild boar, Dandelion added gravely. You're a fool, poet. The whole point is for the mutt or swine to pull the mandrake out of the ground, for then the vegetables, curses and spells fall on the said creature, while the herbalist, hiding safely, far away in the bushes, gets out in one piece. Well, Master Regis, am I talking sense? An interesting method, the alchemist admitted, smiling mysteriously. Interesting mainly for its ingenuity. The disadvantage, however, is its extreme complexity. For in theory, the rope ought to be enough, without the draft animal. I wouldn't suspect Mandrake of having the ability of knowing who or what's pulling the rope. The spells and curses should always fall on the rope, which after all is cheaper and less problematic to use than a dog, not to mention a pig. Are you jesting? Wouldn't dream of it. I said I admire the ingenuity. Besi because although the Mandrake, contrary to popular opinion, is incapable of casting spells or curses, it is, in its raw state, an extremely toxic plant to the extent that even the earth around the root is poisonous. Sprinkling the fresh juice onto the face or on a cut hand, why, even breathing in its fumes, may all have fatal consequences. I wear a mask and gloves, which doesn't mean I have anything against the rope method. Someone um, calls Dandelion a fucking poetaster, which I think is a great word. And uh, some of the sections start with uh, quotes here, and I want to read a couple of, from this one here. So a vampire, or upir, is a dead person brought to life by chaos. Having lost its first life, a V enjoys its second life during the night hours. It leaves its grave by the light of the moon, and only under its light may it act, assailing sleeping maidens or young swains, who it wakes not, but whose blood it sucks. That was Physiologus. And here we have Sylvester Bugiardo from Liber Tenebrarum, or the book of fell but authentic cases never explained by science. The peasants consumed garlic in great abundance, and for greater certainty hung strings of garlic around their necks. Some, womenfolk in particular, stopped up their orifices with whole bulbs of garlic. The whole hamlet stank of garlic horrendous, so the peasants believed they were safe and that the vampire was incapable of doing them harm. Mighty was their astonishment, however, when the vampire who flew to their hamlet at midnight was not in the least afraid and simply began to laugh, gnashing his teeth in delight and jeering at them. It is good, he said, that you have spiced yourselves, for I shall soon devour you and season meat as more to my taste. Apply also salt and pepper to yourselves and forget not the mustard. Let me get some misogyny and in return, I can't remember whether the guy dies or not, but uh, this female character punches somebody anyway, punches him out. No one's asking you to, wench, said the one with the shaggy fringe. This requires a bold and strong blade, a maid's place is in the kitchen, bustling around the stove. A wench may come in handy later, true enough, because a virgin's tears are very useful against a vampire, for if you sprinkle a vampire with them, he burns up like a firebrand. But the tears must be shed by a pure and untouched wench, and you don't quite look the part, love, so you're not much use for anything. Milva took a quick step forward, and her right fist shot out as fast as lightning. 
There was a crack and the peasant's head lurched backwards, which meant his bristly throat and chin created an excellent target. The girl took another step and struck straight ahead with the heel of her open hand, increasing the force of the blow with a twist of her hips and shoulders. The peasant staggered backwards, tripped over his own feet and keeled over, banging the back of his head with an audible thud against the men here. And then when she discovers that she killed the man, uh, she turns around, staggers, rests her forehead against the men here and vomits violently. Geralt says, I'd rather you didn't brew it who I am and what my name is. And um, I've never come across that word before, but I guess it comes from the French, which would be bruit, which means like sound. Or noise. And we get this little bit, um, we'll soon learn more about women, Regis muttered. This is a phobia in a pure clinical form. The devout man must often dream about a vagina dentata, uh, which is a toothed vagina. Terrifying. And then this priest is all like, that lass is a witch. And to prove that she isn't a witch, they're going to do a trial in which they ask people to lift up a coal without burning their hands. And it's like, yeah, but if. If they manage to do that without burning their hands, that sounds like witchcraft to me. Luckily they have a vampire around. And then Gerard and Dandelion are captured and they end up um, drinking from a horse's water trough. And I like this this uh, mention of this torture here because I'm evil like that. And now, Falitiana continued, wiping his sweaty neck with a scarf. Let's have a little chat, Master Kidnapper. To make the conversation flow, let me clarify a few points. There is maple syrup in the canteen. Should our little chat not proceed in a spirit of mutual understanding and complete frankness, we shall copiously anoint your head with the aforementioned syrup, paying very close attention to your eyes and ears. Then we should place you on an anthill, this one here to be precise, over which these charming, hard-working insects are scurrying. Let me add that this method has already proven its worth in the case of several Doyen and Angavar, who evince great stubbornness and a lack of candor. And he talks, of course he does. I want to read this little bit of combat here. The leading rider who had fought ahead flew at him with a raised battle axe, but had no way of knowing he was attacking a witcher. Geralt dodged the blow effortlessly and seized the Nilf guardian leaning over in the saddle by his cloak, while the fingers of his other hand caught the soldier's broad belt. He pulled the rider from the saddle with a powerful wrench and fell on him, pinning him to the ground. Only then did Geralt realise he had no weapon. He caught the man by the throat, but couldn't throttle him because of his iron gorget. The Nilf guardian struggled, hit him with an armoured gauntlet and gashed his cheek. The witcher smothered his opponent with his entire body, groped for the misery cord in the broad belt and jerked it out of its sheath. The man on the ground felt it and howled. Geralt fended off the arm with a silver scorpion on the sleeve that was still hitting him and raised the dagger to strike. The Nilf guardian screamed. The witcher plunged the misery cord into his open mouth, up to the hill. What a way to go. This great line here, perhaps he'll realise the only activity that's worth doing alone is wanking. And another little combat scene I want to share with you here. She let him approach, even somewhat slowing her horse. When he struck, rising up in the stirrups, she leant far out from the saddle, skillfully ducking under his blade, then sat back up, pushing off hard against the stirrups. The horseman was quick and agile and managed to strike again. This time she parried obliquely, and when the sword slid away, she struck the horseman in the hand from below with a short lunge, then swung her sword in a feint towards his face. He involuntarily covered his head with his left hand, and she deftly turned the sword around in her hand and slashed him in the armpit, a cut she had practiced for hours at Kaer Morhen. The Nilf guardian slid from his saddle, fell to the ground, lifted himself up onto his knees, and howled like an animal, desperately trying to staunch the blood gushing from his severed arteries. Siri watched him for a moment, as usual fascinated by the sight of a man fiercely fighting death with all his strength. She waited for him to bleed out, then she rode off without looking back. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy Baptism of Fire by Andrzej Sapkowski. I think it's probably the best of the Witcher novels so far in the series. To begin with, uh, I really enjoyed the short stories and felt as though he wasn't able to cover as much ground with the novels, but I think the first couple of novels in the series are much more setting the scene and world building and up to, uh, when we reach this point, everything's starting to come to a head, you know? Uh, so it was enough to keep me reading from start to finish and like constantly enjoying it as well, you know? There weren't any lulls in the action or anything like that. A lot of cool like philosophy and stuff to chat about. So yeah, overall I gave it a four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of Baptism of Fire by Andrzej Sapkowski. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.